Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope you'll enjoy this talk. This is um, probably the, the talk with the most slides I ever did. Um, so I'm going to have to speed up a bit. And it's about a performance, so that should, should work out. So um, a bit about myself. I'm Mark Lemberg. I've been with Python for a very, very long time, as you can see. Um, I have a company, Egenix. We do pri uh, Python projects. I'm a Python core developer, software foundation member. Uh, I'm also a member of the uh, EuroPython Society based in Düsseldorf, Germany. And um, I do coaching and consulting. And what I want to talk about today is uh, how to speed up your Python programs without having, actually having to do much. You just have to uh, be careful about how you write certain things. So this is the agenda. I'm going to go through all these uh, different subjects. I'm going to start with the calls and the loops that you have in Python. So say you want to, you want to call a function then there are various ways you can do that. And uh, as you've probably noticed, every now and then, Python function calls are not really that, that fast. They're actually quite slow. This is one of the areas that, that we always try to speed up things um, so that C Python can run faster. Now, if you call C functions that are exposed in Python, they are much faster. And as you can see with the timings here, uh, it makes a difference. Of course, most object-oriented programs will probably use method calls. And method calls are even slower than the, the regular C uh, functions, uh, the regular Python functions, because they have this additional method lookup that you have to do in order to, to find out which function to call. So um, there's nothing really much you can do about this particular kind of method. Uh, you can try to use operators, for example, to speed up things a bit, because they are implemented as bytecodes in, in the Python VM. But overall, the situation looks like this. So uh, if you can try to, try to have a Python call a C method or a C function to make things run faster. Or if you're just using simple types in your functions or methods, you can try to rewrite them using uh, Cython, which is very easy. You just have to uh, provide it with a few annotations, and it generates C speed code, and that's really fast. So that was uh, function calls. Next is loops. Uh, yeah, basically, you have two types of loops. One is you, uh, you want to just iterate over a certain range, and the second one is you want to iterate over a sequence. So let's have a look at the sequences first. There are a number of ways you can, you can run over a sequence. Uh, the, the first one, of course, is the for loop. Um, then you have the map fun function you can use. You have list comprehensions, and you have generator expressions. And uh, I did some timing of all these different methods. And as you can see, list comprehensions are the fastest. So it's uh, the very simple kind of approach to take there to make it run faster is to use list comprehensions for your code. Now, this is for calling operations that are implemented in Python. So the, the op function in here is a Python function. If you do the same in C, then it, uh, it runs a lot faster. But also the difference between the various uh, approaches of doing these things uh, become a lot more obvious. So list comprehensions really win in this case. Now, the, the second topic is loops over ranges. So you want to iterate, say, we want to call something a 1,000 times or 10 times. Uh, this is typically done using the range function in Python. And range gives you back a list of, in this case, for example, 1,000 integers. Then there's a little known function called xrange. How many of you do, do know xrange? <laughs> OK, so strike the little known, <laughs> which is actually good. Because if you compare those two, you can see that there's a huge difference between using range and xrange. So um, xrange just uses 40 bytes, because it's a, it's a generator. And with the list, you actually have to, you have to create the list, and it takes uh, 32 kilobytes of memory, runs a lot slower. So yeah, the obvious answer here, of course, is to use xrange. And because it's so obvious, it was changed in Python 3. So in Python 3, range is actually the xrange uh, function from Python 2. There is a, a module called iterTools. How many of you know iterTools? Oh, that's very good. If you don't know that module yet, you should definitely have a look at the documentation. It's an uh, excellent module for implementing uh, things that you want to do in loops. Uh, if you can't use one of those, try to find some C extension that was written for your specific use case. 
and then uh, try to use the functions defined in there. For example, if you're doing lots of math, you can do use uh, NumPy arrays. If you do image work, then you can use PIL. If you use XML, you use LXML. Or if you do text parsing, you can do use, for example, MX text tools. So that's what you can do to speed up your program in that area. So next is sorting. Um, there are two basic methods that you use in, in Python to do sorting. One is the sort method in Python, and the other is the sorted built-in. How many of you know the sorted built-in? Okay, not all of you. Um, the difference here is, is that the lsort method actually does an in-place operation, so it changes the list that you're working on, whereas the sorted built-in, it creates a copy, a list copy of what you want to sort. Now, the, the great thing about sorted is that it takes just a, an iterator as input, just so you can put in anything that you can iterate over, whereas with the, sort, uh, with the sort method that you have on list, you can only operate on lists, of course. <coughs> Now here's a, a typical way of, of sorting uh, a list, for example, on the second item. So what you, um, what you do is, or what you can do is, you use this decorate, sort, and then undecorate pattern. How many of you know that one? Very few. Uh, in Perlland, it's called Swatchian transform. Maybe you know that one. What you do is you, uh, as you can see in the, in, the, in the first part here, you decorate your list, so you, you, you create a new list, that has the, the, the item that you want to sort on as first item in the tuple. And then in the second item, you just put in the original uh, entry that you have in the list, and you sort it, and then you undecorate it again. So you remove that, that item again, and you get back a sorted sequence. And you can do the same thing with sorted uh, and the, the generator approach. Now, uh, Python can do better on this one. It can use a key-based key approach for sorting. So what happens is, uh, Python will then call a key function on every single element that you have in your list and then just sort the keys. And then, of course, uh, you see the, um, the information that it got from where to move which uh, item of that sequence for actually creating the real uh, final list of sorted items. So you can do that either in, in, uh, in Python using, for example, Lambda function, or there's an operator module and that operator module has a nice utility called item getter, which basically does exactly the same thing as the lambda function that you have um, in the first example. How many of you know the, the, this helper? Quite a few, that's good. The operator module has a lot of nice functions, so you should definitely have a look at it if you don't know it. Uh, this is the same example, but it uses, uh, it, it tries to uh, fetch an, an attribute of of the uh, objects that you have in your sequence. So it uses the last name attribute in this case. And again, you can see you can do it much faster using the operator module. So that's a tip that you can use in your code to make it run faster. Next is joining strings. You probably all know the two different methods that you can, or patterns that you can use for doing that in Python. Of course, you have the, the plus sign, so you can have the, you can, can, you can concatenate strings uh, to, to make bigger strings. That's good f if you just have a few of those uh, strings to concatenate, because every time that operator gets called, it does a copy of what it has and then adds something new to it. The second approach is using join and then a list of the entries that you want to join. And that, as you can see in this case, even if you have just four strings to join, it actually makes a difference. But it's a lot more obvious uh, if you have many strings to join. Of course, no one would write the, the plus notation <laughs> for a thousand elements, but uh, just for comparison, it's really, uh, the, the difference there is really enormous. And then there are some other methods you can use. One is the, uh, the percent sign formatting way. It's ugly, it's not really fast, don't use it. <laughs> then uh, some people, uh, sometimes on the mailing list, they mention, yeah, well, you can use the array module for doing the same thing. Uh, yeah, it does work, but it's even slower. Or you can use the C string IO module in Python 2. Um, to, to uh, basically then just write to, your, to, your, uh, to an in-memory string and try to use that for, for speeding up things, but it doesn't really, doesn't really work. So those should not really be used. Right, next is lookups. So we're going to start with dictionary lookups. Um, I did some timing there. I used a dictionary with integer keys and then one with uh, string keys, and I found integer keys to be really, really fast. So if you have something that you can 
You can uh, map to integers, for example, and constants that you want to look up. Then using integers as keys in dictionaries is really a good idea. If you have strings, the problem there is that Python always has to do the string comparison in order to make sure that the string that it fetched from the dictionary is actually the one that you want to, to use. There is a trick, though, that you can use to, to speed that up. You can intern the strings. How many of you know intern? Few. So uh, intern is, is really nice in that it creates just a single copy of that particular string in memory. The downside there is that once you've interned that string, it'll never go away. So garbage collection no longer works on that, um, on that string. But as you can see, the performance is a lot better. And the reason for that is Python uses this internally to do attribute lookups, for example. So it speeds up attribute looks up a lot by interning the, the attributes that you want to look up in your, in your code. Provided, of course, that Python knows about the attributes, so it has to be in your C code, uh, in, your, in the uh, Python code you that you write. Right, next one is variable lookups. So obviously, global lookups are slower than the locals. So if you uh, do the timing, there's a, a small difference that you can see there. Let's have a closer look at the global lookups because there are some te techniques that are being used to speed those up. So the general kind of approach that you uh, do is, is this one. You just have the global there and you just use it in your Python function, which is not really, it's not really that bad, the performance. Then there's a trick uh, that some people use. They put the global into a local variable by adding it to a function as keyword argument default. How many of you know that trick? Few. Well, as, you, as you can see, it doesn't make much difference. You, had 81, you have 81 microseconds here, and in this one is 85 microseconds. The downside here is that even though it runs a bit faster, it can also uh, create bugs in your application because people can actually pass in that, that uh, argument to your function, and then, of course, your function won't work anymore. Um, then there is an approach to localize the global in your function. And as you can see here, it uses 90 microseconds. So it's slower if you just use it a few times. If you have a, a tight loop in there, then this makes a lot of sense. So for example, if, if instead of just using x equals local a, if you had a, a for loop in there using that global, then doing this does make sense. So you can try to use that. So these are the timings for the various lookups. If you can, use a local. I think that's what you can take away from that. Then the next type of lookup is attribute lookups. So you have a standard client of class definition here. You have class attributes. You have instance attributes. And then if you uh, time those two, you'll find something very interesting. It's that instance attribute lookups are basically the same speed as class attribute lookups, even though Python has to go from the instance to the class in order to do the class lookup, which is interesting. So what to take away from this is that you, it doesn't really pay off localizing the class attributes in your instances. They just take away more memory, so you don't have to use that. Now, I also compared the old style classes with the new style ones. How many of you know this difference between old style and new, new style? Okay, not that many. So some years ago, uh, Guido went ahead and, and he tried to unify the the two type systems that we have in, in Python. One is called the, well, it's called the old style classes now. Um, and all the classes that you wrote in Python were old style classes. And all the types that you used internally, like lists or dictionaries, for example, those were a separate kind of type system. And what we have now is we have a unification of those two, and those are called the new style classes. And as you can see here, old style classes uh, actually do behave better in some uh, cases. For example, the instance attribute lookup for all side classes is faster. And that might be something that we would want to perhaps improve in CPython. <coughs> then there's something called slot attributes. How many of you know that one? Okay, a few. It's very good. Should, you should definitely have a look at those. Um, this is an optimization that was added to, to Python a while ago. I think it was around the same time as the, the, this, uh, these new style classes were introduced. Um, this is a way to basically define your, uh, the, the attributes that you have in your class instances uh, in a way that Python can optimize them. 
So you no longer create a dictionary for those. And because you no longer have to create dictionary, the lookups are faster. Uh, the uh, the uh, lookups don't have to go to the dictionary anymore, and you don't have to spend extra memory on your dictionary. So while this is not exactly, uh, it's not really faster than than dictionaries, it does make a huge huge difference in terms of memory usage. And I'm going to give a lightning talk tomorrow about this case uh, with some interesting results. Right. The next one is exceptions. Now, um, exceptions are or should be used in Python only for exceptional cases. So only when you actually write code that only fails in a, in a certain uh, small percentage of cases. You should, you should never try to, to write code that fails often and then runs the exception case very often. And this is why. This is just an example. You use attribute introspection, and uh, you want to see whether a certain object has an attribute, attribute or not. And as you can see, if the exception triggers, and you actually have to go into, the, into that accept part of the try accept, it takes very, very long to, to run. Whereas if the exception does not trigger, it doesn't take long to run. So what can you do about that? Well, again, you can try to have Python catch the exception at C level, because at C level, it doesn't have to do all this, uh, the, the frame logic that's normally needed to process exceptions. Uh, it can run much, much faster. And for example, in this case, you can use the get adder built in to do the lookup for you. And that will catch the exception, the attribute error in C, and it runs faster, as you can see here. So this is just one example. There are other examples. Uh, there are many cases in, in Python where you have the option of either using a method or a function that actually creates or uh, raises an exception, or you have uh, this more or less the same kind of thing that returns, for example, none or some special value that you can then use to, um, to detect that exceptional case. So what's the conclusion? There are a few things that you can do, like you just saw, that you can do to speed up your code by just being aware of these things. And of course, there are a lot of things that you can do at a higher level uh, in your application. The most, uh, the most efficient ways of, of doing these uh, performance improvements is by using proper data structures for these things. So if you have a, a certain specialized case of where you need a, a certain, say, a tree, for example, as data structure, then use that. Uh, you can use efficient algorithms. There are lots of books on that. And um, I would really urge everyone to, to have a look at those books because the research has been done, uh, the algorithms are there, they're not difficult to understand. There are even Python books that implement those algorithms and you should definitely use them. And of course, you can refactor your code every now and then. Move loops to C, do profiling, and then maybe use Cython, for example, to uh, speed up your code. Right, that was it. All the resources are up on GitHub at that URL. Uh, all the, the tests that I ran are up there. There is um, a helper module that's uh, kind of interesting. It's the perf tool, it's called. Um, you can do the timing with those functions. You can do the memory <coughs> checking with those uh, functions. And if you need help, just contact me. Right, that was it. Any questions? Does this work now? Or? Yeah. Hi, can you recommend any frameworks for, for, for performance testing? The only one that I've used uh, was vBench, which was Wes McKinney's sort of thing uh, that was part of Pandas, but we used that quite successfully because you could monitor your performance every time you check the code in, you'd run our battery of tests and plot it, and you could see over time if you're all refactoring. Do you know of any other ones? Because vBench, I think, is a bit of a legacy now, and it's been touched for a while. Well, I mean, it's not really a framework, but you can just use the standard C profile module that you have in Python and just run your code using an, under that profiler, and then you get the output, and you can use that for detecting the, the hotspots in your code. I'm not sure whether that's what you actually meant with the framework, but... I, I'm seeing it for more larger scale, more larger scale tests than that. So. Well, some of, the, some of the, the, the testing frameworks that you have, they allow you to enable profiling while running the tests. Yeah, and you can use that for, for doing this. More questions?
You, you mentioned siphon. I'm just wondering if you've tried doing those tests with number instead of siphon. Uh, no, not yet. Um, I recommend you do. From what I've been seeing from benchmarks of my own, number makes Python run as fast as C. Okay, definitely give that a try, yeah. Um, similar to the first question, I wonder whether there are any load testing uh, frameworks that you've used. Uh, what exactly do you mean with load testing? Like what I, uh, what I did here with the range 1000 list as well, input? Or I was more meaning uh, sort of, say it's a piece of server code than uh, something for running lots and lots of uh, requests against that server in parallel. Right, well, for, for, for web server stuff, you can use the Apache tool, the AB tool, to do your benchmarking. And you can use that to generate the load and then uh, do profiling maybe on, the, on your code. So for example, you can, you can use that as input to generate the, all the requests and then have your, your C profile do the profiling on your, on your Python code and then use the output of that to analyze your code. Yeah. What kind of project have you been, or what project have you been doing that's required all of these performance optimizations to be made? Uh, well, a few years ago, let's say that was 1997, I started writing a web application framework like everyone else uh, at that time. And uh, I wanted to have it run as fast as possible, so I did all these tests back then for Python 1.5.2 it was. And I, I thought um, this year I could basically do the same again for Python 2.7, and I found these values, and that was interesting. Okay, uh, in terms of the exceptions, uh, isn't it more Pythonic to actually try something and fail over on exception and do something at that point? I know you showed one workaround for like a value error through the uh, item getter, but there are other things, but I can't think of anything at the moment, but I know like I've done that in, in so many parts of the code where you try, fail, and on that exception you actually have a block of code, so you code by exception, which is more Pythonic apparently. So is, it, is there any other way to actually work around other than using the one option you showed for value error? Well, I mean, this, these are just performance uh, hints or tips. Yeah, the, these are not general kind of design uh, recommendations. You should not always write your code in a way that, that it makes it most performant because it usually becomes less readable that way. But if you do have a case where you actually want to speed up your code, then you should definitely have a look at these things. So I'm not saying uh, that was, that's not the point of the talk to, to, run your, uh, to, to write your code in a way that, that uh, just goes through hoops to make things more run faster and then less readable. So that doesn't really make sense. More questions? No? Ah, one more. And then Larry, want to set up? Yeah? Uh, I was actually wondering, does it make a lot of difference how deep in the stack an exception is raised before you catch it? Say if you say if it's like 10, uh, 10 functions deep uh, and, you, and you call it say the roots or if you, or if you call it like earlier on, how much difference that makes? That's a good question. If you're, if you're doing that in Python, it might make a difference because um, but I have to really have to check that because I don't know whether the traceback is actually being generated when you enter the accept uh, part of the of the code uh, in Python. If 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 the uh, if Python has to generate the traceback at that point, then of course yes, a, a deep stack will obviously take more time to generate that. If it doesn't have to generate the traceback, then it probably doesn't make any difference. All right. Thank you. Thank you.